Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Okay, oh well, then. this is not such a big lecture theatre. Welcome to this year's summer school. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon Associate Professor Shadrach Shrikuru. He's in the Department of Archaeology here at UCT. Um, he's quite well known in his field. Um, Shadrach um, completed his PhD in archaeology uh, at, the, at, university of, at the University College of London. His doctoral thesis explored the technology and socio-cultural metaphors associated with pre-colonial iron production in northern Zimbabwe. He has two broad research interests, namely uh, artifact studies and heritage management in contemporary Africa. He combines archaeological, anthropological, and historical approaches with standard metallurgical and mineralogical techniques to investigate pre-colonial met metal extractive technologies. He will explain to you what all that means. <laughs> you can decode, decode the code for that. And um, he, and it's associated socio-cultural processes. Currently, his research in this field is, an, is on indigenous mining and metallurgy in southern Africa. He is also actively involved with research on heritage management in contemporary Africa. Shadrach is quite widely published. Um, he has recently published uh, 2015 Metals in Society, Indigenous African Metallurgy in a Global Perspective. In 2010, <coughs> he also published Indigenous Mining and Metallurgy in Africa by Cambridge University Press. And together with other scholars, Peter Delius, Esther Eisen, and Skuman and Mlazi, uh, Mapungub, we reconsidered. I give you Shadrach. I was a DJ, then I would say one, two for testing. Anyway, um, good afternoon, everybody. The wonders of, uh, of books. Uh, look at what I saw in the foyer. I'm not saying that I'm yearning for the deep past or something like that. It's just that I'm an archaeologist who deal with uh, very old things, and I happen to come from a country called Zimbabwe, which used to be called Rhodesia, by the way. Anyway. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about um, a subject that uh, is uh, very um, interesting uh, for me. And uh, it's also a subject that is uh, um, controversial, particularly um, in, the, in the context of the, of the present. Uh, how many of us do not have metal on us today? Metal, just in general. <laughs> Can we survive without metal? The fact that nobody is answering perhaps suggests that uh, it's something that um, angers all, all our lives. So what I will, what I will be doing today is um, sketching with uh, a fairly uh, broad uh, brush um, the history and beginning of, um, of metalworking, uh, particularly in the Middle East, and then uh, with um, a heavy emphasis on, uh, on Africa. So I have uh, organized uh, this uh, series of lectures um, according to themes today. Um, I will talk mostly about um, origins, when did um, metalworking begin, when and where, and uh, with what uh, consequences. And then um, tomorrow, I will give um, a more a detailed and focused um, case study, particularly um, 
mining and metallurgy in uh, ancient Egypt as well as the, uh, the Middle East. And then I will move on to West Africa as well as um, uh, Southern Africa and then give uh, a concluding uh, overview. So today is just a, a, general, um, a general overview um, which is aimed at just uh, emphasizing some key and uh, essential points uh, in the development of, uh, of metallurgy. One of the things that we might need to bear in mind is that um, of all the metals that are known uh, today, probably before the 18th century, it was um, at least um, 14, 15 that were, that were known. And um, not surprisingly, people talk of uh, the um, metals of um, the seven metals of um, ancient civilizations. And I will also um, speak, to, speak to that. So we owe a lot uh, to the Industrial Revolution. Um, most of the, the metals uh, that we have today. So aluminum, for example, uh, which requires very uh, high uh, temperatures to, um, to smelt. Uh, it was uh, one of the outcomes of the Industrial uh, Revolution. So perhaps um, for us to understand um, the significance of uh, metallurgy today, without uh, arguing that uh, metallurgy would have had uh, a similar impact um, in the past. It is um, important to just um, flag uh, a few issues as a way of um, contextualizing um, the significance of um, uh, mining and metallurgy in human history. So one way of um, looking at it is um, what would the world look like without metal today? Structural engineering, um, transportation, and everything. Uh, what would be the nature of uh, those things? And can we do without, uh, without metal? Since everything from um, utilitarian uh, objects to uh, expressive materials, so if you like uh, bling, earrings, and stuff like that, that's all, um, that's all metal. And um, virtually all the world's eminent civilizations, uh, from the Middle East to China to Latin America, Mesoamerica and so on, they are also based on working a metal. So the beginning of metallurgy actually um, initiated long distance um, trading uh, networks, particularly across uh, the Middle East, extending into China, extending into Europe, and extending into uh, parts of, uh, of Africa. So globalization as we know it today, we can trace it back to um, the need uh, to work uh, metals. So the emergence of uh, centralized states, uh, governance, uh, centralized governments, and so on. It can also be attributed partly to uh, the onset of uh, metalworking. The Industrial Revolution is actually um, a culmination of um, cumulative advances in mining and metallurgy throughout, um, throughout the years. And even today, the South African economy is still, uh, to some extent, based on mining and, uh, and metallurgy. So that is um, something that um, is uh, important to us today. But perhaps what we are interested in uh, today is um, what do we know about the history of metallurgy in the world? So um, it's also interesting that um, John Compton is, uh, is here because uh, this contradiction, which I am flagging uh, here, on the one hand, um, the earliest evidence of mining is from um, Africa. So a number of places in the Southern Cape, uh, Pinnacle Point, uh, Blombos Cave, and uh, related uh, places. So the earliest exploitation of um, pigment, a uh, hematite, which was used as uh, ochre by um, Middle Stone Age populations, has been dated to about um, 120 thousand uh, years ago. But um, the earliest evidence of uh, mining with um, intent uh, to uh, process the ores to uh, gain a usable uh, metal is something that started uh, very, 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 very late. 
And um, depending on where you are in Africa, in Southern Africa, it started around. It's nice acoustics, though. It's nice acoustics. <laughs> So in Southern Africa, the earliest uh, evidence of um, metalworking dates to AD 200. In Egypt, that's um, around uh, 5,000, 6,000 BC. In West Africa, that's around um, 1,000 uh, or 2,000 BC. Depending on who you, depending on who you read, the evidence tends to be uh, quite um, controversial. So we have to uh, realize that in as much as the evidence for uh, mining is, has been dated uh, to a very early time period in Africa, um, mining uh, with um, a metallurgical goal in mind is something that is uh, very, 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 very recent. Um, so beginning uh, around um, 2,000 years um, before present, if one is to use a generous um, estimate. So, here is uh, a timeline of the beginning of uh, metallurgy in the, in the world. So perhaps a question that is uh, important to ask at this point in time is that um, for roughly 99.5% um, of um, human history, uh, human beings were using a stone to make uh, tools. And uh, they were using both um, utilitarian, expressive, and, and so on. So the actual uh, exploitation of, um, of metal is something that is um, recent, if we consider that very long um, history of, um, of humanity. But so the question here is that um, why the change from stone to metal? If, um, as I'm saying, for a larger part of um, human history, uh, people were are making stone. And uh, even in the uh, recent past, there are still some populations that use uh, stone to make tools, which means that stone is really um, effective. So why the change? And when, did we, when do we start um, seeing uh, that change uh, in the archaeological record? According to um, the American uh, scholar, uh, Cyril uh, Stanley uh, Smith. He argues that um, the beginning of metallurgy, particularly um, in the Middle East, um, in places such as um, Central uh, Turkey, um, Anatolia, and um, surrounding regions, he argues that the beginning of uh, metallurgy had nothing to do with uh, practical functions at all. But uh, it had everything to do with, um, with colors with um, utilitarian, uh, with uh, expressive purposes. So Cyril Stanley Smith um, argues that the beginning of metallurgy actually owes um, a lot to humanity's fascination with um, colors and uh, later on with, uh, with sound. Because according to him, stone was actually a very uh, effective uh, raw material for making, for making tools. So, um, some of the clearest uh, evidence of um, humanity's uh, encounters with uh, minerals that are bare uh, metal when um, reduced or smelt are uh, dates to around uh, 10,000 years before present in, at places such as um, the archaeological site of Chattel Hoyuk where Ian Horder and colleagues have been um, carrying out uh, research and that's in central Turkey. So at um, sites, um, archaeological sites in that uh, region, there is evidence that um, uh, during um, the uh, Neolithic, um, human beings were um, looking for copper ores, such as malachite and azurite, and they were shaping them to produce um, green uh, beads or blue beads if it is azurite. So that is the very first use of um, these um, uh, copper um, uh, carbonates uh, or copper uh, oxides. They are used um, as, um, as glass beads, as part of necklaces. So 10,000 years before present, there is no evidence that human beings are direct, uh, are intentionally smelting um, copper ores 
uh, to uh, produce a metal for a wide uh, variety of, um, of purposes. Uh, slightly uh, later than that, maybe 900, 800 uh, years before present, depending on who you read, there is also evidence that um, some populations in modern day Bulgaria, uh, Serbia, and thereabout were also uh, working a uh, gold to uh, produce, um, again, um, a beads. So gold um, existing in its um, native form uh, in nature, it does not require any, any, any smelting. So that would uh, explain uh, why it would have been uh, used. So again, we need to emphasize um, the uh, fact that according to some scholars such as um, uh, Cyril Smith, um, the earliest uh, use of uh, metal perhaps owes a lot to um, the colors, um, to the sound, and he is convinced that it had nothing to do with um, utilitarian purposes. Part of, uh, the, of his reasoning comes from the fact that around um, AD, around um, 800 BC or thereabout, uh, we begin to see the evidence um, that human beings were um, exploiting a native copper, which is um, copper in its um, natural state. So native copper is um, widely available in uh, different um, places uh, in, the, in the world. Um, the um, Great Lakes uh, region in the United States is actually one of the areas that is, uh, so the area around Lake Superior and or thereabout, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, native copper there. So there is evidence that um, communities in the Middle East they were um, hammering at that um, native copper to produce um, implements. Nevertheless, the uptake of that uh, technology was not really uh, huge. So it's one or two items, um, amethyst um, a technology that was um, dominated by a polished um, stone um, axes, uh, the so-called uh, Neolithic uh, tools. It was only around um, 7,000 uh, BC, based on uh, current evidence, that um, cultures that are known by archaeologists as the um, Vinja cultures in uh, modern day uh, Serbia, um, they, in addition to working native copper, they also started uh, intentional uh, smelting of carbonate and oxide uh, ores. So the technology is still a very, very, um, uh, very, very, if we may use the word in quotes, uh, very uh, primitive in the sense that um, if you have a very rich um, carbonate ores, uh, which do not have um, uh, many accessory rocks, uh, rocks uh, it would be easy to, uh, to smelt them. So some of the uh, researchers working in this uh, region believe that, um, so for one to smelt, you need a number of, uh, of things. You need um, a source of heat, and also you need um, a source of air, and you also need um, the, the raw materials, which would be um, the ore itself. So um, throughout uh, the, um, the development of metallurgy, we see uh, people are uh, using uh, bellows um, at different points uh, in time. I will elaborate uh, on that um, a little bit uh, later on. But it is believed uh, through experimental replication that uh, during the beginning of metallurgy at this period, um, human beings were actually blowing uh, the furnaces uh, using the, uh, the mouth. So you just have um, like a long reed and then you blow into, into a fire. Uh, tomorrow I will show you evidence of that, uh, of those reconstructions from some of the tomb paintings um, in, um, in Egypt. So that's, that, that, that is what is also um, being used uh, to, support, uh, to support that. And uh, so from 7,000 BC, um, intentional copper smelting was um, well established uh, at a very a small scale in areas such as Serbia, uh, Turkey, Iran, and um, perhaps um, Egypt. Then um, with uh, time, um, came the, what is known as uh, the, uh, the Bronze Age. So bronze is one of the most important um, alloys in the history of um, human um, 
a civilization or the development of uh, humanity. Bronze uh, is um, a mixture of uh, copper and, uh, and tin. But uh, what happened is that towards the end of the Chalcolithic or the uh, Copper Age, so around 4000 uh, BC, archaeologists um, start uh, to see evidence of uh, copper that is uh, rich in, uh, in arsenic. So the earliest uh, bronzes were not uh, tin bronzes per se, but uh, they were uh, what are known as arsenical uh, bronzes. And um, it is um, debatable whether the arsenic and uh, the copper were intentionally alloyed or it was just uh, a result of um, a coarse melting. So if you were to uh, smelt uh, some uh, arsenic-rich uh, uh, copper ores such as um, olivanite, uh, you might actually come up with um, an arsenical bronze. So this is just uh, an unintentional uh, process. But with time, human beings would have um, learned about uh, the, the benefits of that. Because if you add um, a little uh, bit of um, uh, arsenic or a tin to copper, then it transforms, it enhances the, uh, the properties, uh, the workability becomes much better, the hardness, the resistance, and all the good uh, qualities. And um, the Bronze Age is also uh, the time period that uh, some of the earliest uh, civilizations, particularly in the Middle East, um, are developed. So 2000 BC, 2500 BC, or thereabout, we are, if you believe in that, we are in the uh, time of, uh, the, of the Bible. So those stories in the Bible, um, occupation of places such as Jericho and, and so on, this is uh, clearly in the uh, late uh, Bronze Age. So the, in terms of uh, the world's, um, some of the world's earliest uh, civilizations, the city-states of Sumer, uh, such as A, um, Uruk, and, 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 and others, they are actually um, the way established during the uh, late Bronze Age um, period. And also extending from the Middle East right up to China, around 2500 BC, we also see um, the first um, appearance of, um, of tin bronzes. So one of the most interesting uh, developments during this time period is that, yes, if you add um, tin, to a copper, you create um, a very useful uh, alloy. And how it works is that if you add, let's say, between five and um, between uh, one and uh, five percent of tin to, to copper, you are going to have uh, low tin uh, bronzes, which also have some specific uh, characteristics. But if you, the more tin you add, um, the more brittle the uh, alloy uh, becomes such that um, around um, 1500 BC or thereabout, there are what are known as those, uh, what are known as um, uh, le uh, the Bronze Age uh, mirrors. So human beings were um, adding, let's say, 30% um, tin to copper to create a very um, tin-rich uh, bronze. But because it was uh, very uh, brittle, they would also polish uh, the surface so that it reflects, and that was used um, as, uh, as mirrors. And it's uh, a technology that uh, continues right up, to the, um, right up to the Islamic period. And uh, there are some um, high tin bronze uh, mirrors that are known from the uh, Swahili um, sites uh, along the East African uh, coast. So this is a technology that uh, goes back uh, a long while. And during the uh, late uh, Bronze Age, particularly some of uh, the uh, burials from uh, places such as uh, Air, they also have um, some of the earliest um, evidence of um, earrings uh, made of gold. So, and also some infrastructure for uh, processing makeup and, 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 and so on. So we can trace uh, some of the uh, cultural behaviors that we uh, have uh, today to that uh, deep um, in, the, in the past. So I mentioned the fact that um, bronze is uh, an alloy of um, copper and uh, tin. The most um, interesting question then is that um, copper was uh, widely available in the uh, Middle East um, and the Mediterranean region. So Cyprus 
um, the island of uh, the island of Copa, and there are many other there are many other uh, regions that uh, were uh, rich in in Copa, but tin is uh, perhaps um, more geologically uh, restricted. So it is believed that some of the tin that is being used um, in um, the Middle East uh, and adjacent regions at this point in time was uh, sourced from as far as uh, Afghanistan. There is um, a ship um, that sank uh, off uh, the uh, Mediterranean coast of, um, of Turkey around 1500 uh, BC, so that's a long time ago. It had uh, some of these um, tin ingots that are known as um, ox hide um, ingots, um, simply because the shape um, resembles like um, an ox hide. So that's where the name uh, comes from. So those um, ox hide uh, tin uh, ingots, um, a number of uh, um, researchers such as uh, the Gales at um, uh, Oxford, they uh, fingerprinted uh, the tin to, um, to Afghanistan. So the belief is that some of the uh, tin that is, um, that is being used by um, some of the early uh, civilizations in the Middle East was uh, coming from, um, from the Middle East. And there's also evidence that uh, Africa was uh, well um, integrated into uh, this uh, long distance uh, trade. Because in the same um, Yulubrun um, shipwreck, there is also ebony, and uh, which is believed to have been sourced uh, from, um, from, from the uh, present day um, Sudan. So there are some commodities that are coming from Africa, some which are coming from, um, from Afghanistan. And um, this is evidence that um, a very established and viable long distance uh, trade um, network had been uh, established at this um, point in, um, in time. Um, while it's the, perhaps my last point on this is that um, thefts and, um, and forgeries, they were also um, part of um, human beings during that, um, or back then, because the um, metal ingots that were found uh, on that uh, shipwreck that I mentioned some of them, they had um, those uh, seals, what we now call today uh, trademarks. <laughs> and some of those trademarks can be associated with uh, known uh, workshops um, in Cyprus and the other places. So what was happening back then was that um, the traders, unscrupulous traders, would, uh, in the process of casting copper, they would take um, lead and then uh, cast, uh, pour in a melt of copper around uh, the lead, so that uh, lead is very heavy. So that would inflate the weight of those ingots. So as a way of certifying that this copper is coming out of Shadrach's workshop, we first see what we might call today a commodity branding, and that's uh, 2000 uh, to 1500 uh, BC. So, after the uh, Bronze Age um, came at uh, the Iron Age, and um, iron, um, of course, the working of iron uh, started with uh, the, um, the processing of uh, meteoric iron. So that's iron from the, from the sky, in quotes, as others uh, would um, describe. And the earliest evidence uh, remains uh, that um, Tutankhamun's uh, dagger which dates to around um, 1,500 uh, BC or slightly uh, earlier, which is made of uh, a meteoric uh, iron. But um, the intentional smelting of um, iron, uh, iron ores to produce uh, metallic iron is uh, associated with uh, the Hittites in um, Anatolia as well as the Assyrians. What is interesting is that in as much as um, Iron uh, started uh, as a very uh, prestigious uh, metal, which was uh, closely guarded. So to use a modern day analogy, um, it was like if you possess a knowledge of um, iron working, it's like you had nuclear technology. But um, obviously, uh, with the time, uh, there was a transformation such that uh, uh, by the time of the Greek uh, civilization, uh, iron was known as the democratic metal, simply because it was widely available and uh, everybody uh, could have it. But the most interesting thing was that um, Egypt was very, very, very conservative 
because it only adopted iron after um, 671 uh, BC. That is when it was uh, invaded by the Assyrians. And um, a number of archaeologists uh, ask, um, think that the reason why Egypt was defeated is because it didn't have uh, any, any iron, such that at the beginning of um, iron working in Egypt um, is very, 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 very late when compared to uh, its neighboring uh, regions in the, in the Middle East. And that explains uh, part of the uh, debate uh, whether iron in sub-Saharan Africa came from Egypt or not, because it, the technology dates to almost uh, the, same, the same time. But I'm going to elaborate on that. One of the highlights associated with the development of um, uh, metallurgy is that around uh, 600 BC or thereabout, there was a well-established uh, system of uh, coinage. So coins, copper coins, silver coins, they were well circulated um, in the uh, Middle East as well as uh, in, the, um, in the Mediterranean uh, world. So such that by the time of the Roman Empire, coinage was, um, was well uh, established. And actually one of the amazing things, um, one of the most amazing things is that um, the, today we worry so much, we are concerned about pollution but uh, the pollution associated with the Roman Empire actually is uh, still hounding a people in a modern day Jordan. That is, there is uh, a copper mining uh, landscape which is known as uh, Fenan. The Romans had uh, a very uh, large scale uh, copper working um, industry uh, there, but uh, the, uh, the copper ores um, from the Fenan region, they are rich in, uh, in arsenic and arsenic um, is, um, is poisonous, such that is most of the burials that uh, were um, recovered in that area, they've got a very uh, enriched levels of arsenic. And some studies that were done as um, uh, recently as 2010, they showed that some of the goats that uh, browse around uh, that area, the modern day Fenan, they are also enriched in, um, in arsenic. And that's uh, a legacy of uh, the large scale um, metal working in that region during the, uh, the Roman times. So one of the things to emphasize is that yes, in very uh, broad strokes, we can say that um, there is a copper age, there is a bronze age, and there is an iron age, but um, the periodization, it differs depending on where you are in the, in the world. For example, if you cross the Atlantic, um, there was no iron age, and uh, also there are some amazing developments. For example, uh, by at least 500 BC, the Chinese could produce uh, cast iron, which was only produced by the uh, West um, as a result of the, of the Industrial uh, Revolution. So there are so many developments that are taking place in India, in China, that I did not uh, include here. So for reasons to do with um, uh, time and uh, to make it manageable, I just uh, restricted my focus to the to the Middle East. But what you need to know is that um, there are also other interesting things that are taking place um, elsewhere, particularly in uh, China and um, and India. So all the developments that I was talking about um, from the Chalcolithic, from the Copper Age to uh, the Iron Age, um, basically show that. Um, for the world is, uh, civilizations, we can talk of um, basically uh, seven metals. So gold, copper, silver, lead, tin, iron, and mercury. All the other metals that we can talk about, um, um, they are a result of um, a much, 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 much later, much later processes. So that those protoforms of globalization that I was talking about, they were based on um, on these. Um, on these metals, but the most interesting thing is that mercury was unknown uh, basically in sub-Saharan Africa until after the Portuguese sailed around the, the Cape of Good Hope. And uh, so there are massive, there are massive, uh, there are massive differences. And then silver in, in, in regions such as Southern Africa, it was also um, unknown. So there are massive, there are massive uh, differences. But um, in summary, these are the, what are known as the seven metals of um, ancient uh, civilizations. So um, at this point, I'm now um, closing in on the situation in um, sub-Saharan uh, Africa after that generalized uh, introduction. 
So what we can say is that um, in regions such as the Middle East and uh, surrounding areas, uh, the working of metals started with uh, fairly easier metals. So I mentioned gold, which exists um, in natural uh, form in nature. I mentioned native copper. I mentioned meteoric iron. And then later on, the copper was um, smelted. The temperatures are not as high as the temperatures involved in, in iron smelting. And the iron smelting, which is uh, regarded as um, a little bit complex, was only smelted after 1,500 uh, BC. So this is the trajectory that we see in the Middle East, the trajectory that we see uh, in the Indian subcontinent as well as in China and uh, other places. So the big question is, uh, what was the situation in um, Africa, south of Egypt? <laughs> was, it, uh, was it the same? Was it different? What was, um, what was the picture? So at this point, um, let me just uh, give um, a very brief um, overview in terms of the process uh, technology, what is happening, or what happens in terms of pre-industrial metallurgy. So you start with um, mining. So in this case, let's say, OK, that's iron. So um, extracting mining ores and then um, gathering other raw materials such as uh, clay to make, um, to make this furnace, and then um, charcoal, uh, which um, acted as the, as the fuel. Of course, the Chinese used uh, coal uh, from very, very, very early on, but um, coal, particularly um, in Europe, was something associated with uh, industrial processes, and the same applies to Africa. So for most of this time, it was, um, it was charcoal. So when all the raw materials were uh, gathered, um, they were charged in the, into the furnace. You can see somebody who is uh, bellowing here. After about three to four hours, um, a series of these uh, chemical reactions uh, took place with the result that um, a solid uh, mass of iron was produced together with um, uh, a molten um, iron silicate, which is, basic, which is also known as, uh, known as slag. So that was the process very um, different to uh, the modern uh, blast furnaces uh, that we use today. This was direct in the, this is also known as the direct process in the sense that the metal was uh, usable. In the uh, blast furnace, it's indirect because um, first of all, they produce pig iron, which is then decarburized to produce uh, different uh, grades of, uh, of, of, of iron or steel from wrought iron to uh, whatever still depending on how man, how much uh, carbon is uh, in the in the metal so the iron bloom uh, contained some charcoal it was cleaned um, in a forge and then um, it was then the, the, the smiths also uh, made uh, different types of, um, of of objects so this is basically um, the um, a summary of uh, technologies but obviously uh, as we will see as the week progress um, each region had um, uh, different approaches but basically uh, the apparatus particularly the infrastructure here was uh, the same a clay um, a clay built furnace and um, charcoal acting as a fuel with uh, different types of uh, bellows uh, providing uh, the air to uh, sustain uh, co combustion and then the result uh, were some of those um, uh, products that were widely uh, circulated. So um, this technology appears to be um, universal, but um, there are quite a number of issues, particularly when we talk about um, Africa south of the pyramids. The big questions are where and when did metallurgy begin? And uh, was it local or exotic? And more importantly, Remember, I mentioned that the uh, dominant thinking is that um, in terms of um, metallurgy, one would start with um, the easier uh, steps before uh, getting on to more complicated um, technological processes. So is there a copper age in sub-Saharan Africa? And if so, um, do we have the evidence? And then uh, Southern Africa, which is um, one of um, our regions of interest, how did metallurgy uh, spread? So these are just um, some different uh, places and well-known, um, some of the well-known sites and uh, places associated with uh, metal working in, uh, in, in, in Africa. We will see this map um, again. So 
I also have to state up front that um, the, um, the pattern um, in which uh, the uh, technology dispersed across the African continent is very uh, difficult to um, comprehend. In some areas, um, there is more evidence. In others, there is less evidence, um, which is also complicated by the fact that uh, in regions of Africa where um, there is conflict, not much archaeological research um, takes place. So because of Boko Haram, a very uh, promising region in um, in Nigeria has been uh, abandoned simply because it's not uh, it's not safe. So the traditional view um, regarding the origins of uh, sub-Saharan uh, metallurgy is that um, sub-Saharan Africa borrowed its um, or got its knowledge of metallurgy from the from the Middle East, and then through processes of um, diffusion. The knowledge of uh, metalworking then spread to the Sudan and further to the south and then to, to West Africa. So this is um, the, traditional, uh, the traditional view. And uh, at some point, it was based on um, the uh, dating evidence. So these are some of the arrows that show the, the dispersal. Uh, we can also add uh, some arrows from here because we know that uh, there was um, a metallurgical knowledge uh, that was spread from Spain to a region such as, um, such as Morocco, but that was after Phoenician occupation um, in this uh, area. That is around um, um, in, the, in the early um, centuries, around 800 BC or, or thereabout. So, in its um, early manifestations, uh, this um, traditional diffusionist framework was, um, it argued that, you know, um, it was based on those views that said, well, Africa has never invented anything, but it only received from others. So metallurgy was brought by advanced people from this region into, um, into Africa. And um, however, as a scholarship, um, as more rigorous scholarship um, developed, um, there was um, a belief uh, that um, sub-Saharan metallurgy began in North Africa, and then it spread to the other areas. Some of the reasons were uh, technological, because um, according to uh, David Philipson, um, to argue that um, Africa only started with, um, with iron, um, and not and not and not copper um, is not uh, is not logical. This is um, because perhaps I forgot to mention the point that whereas the picture in the Middle East is uh, that uh, there is the working of copper, bronze, and iron in most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is iron and copper and then bronze and gold. <laughs> so it's the reverse. So the debate then is, um, is it possible to have um, an iron working uh, technology without um, an earlier phase of uh, working native copper or copper smelting? So that is where the, that is where the debate uh, is, and that is where uh, David Philipson is uh, coming from. And uh, here he is saying that because the associated technology, that is iron smelting, is so complex, and in earlier African societies, no other process involved heating materials to such high temperatures, we have to consider the possibility of a northerly source of sub-Saharan iron working knowledge rather than duplicate independent discovery. So what Philipson is saying is that it's very impossible. We cannot say that um, iron working uh, began in Africa simply because it does not uh, match the trajectory in the, in the Middle East. So these are some of the uh, roots that uh, knowledge of metallurgy would have been introduced uh, to um, sub-Saharan Africa according to the external origins uh, hypothesis. We're going to see uh, this map um, again. But um, the most interesting thing is that uh, some of the um, scholars based, on, based in Africa, such as um, Augustine Hall, they are arguing that there are a number of weaknesses associated with the external origins thinking. Um, in particular, the fact that the dating of the earliest appearance of iron in uh, the source areas of uh, North Africa, so in this area here and there, 
the dates according to Augustine Hall and others is just the same as in these areas. So according to, um, according to Augustine Hall then, if we check our time, particularly um, on this uh, map, which is his map, but actually, uh, we can see that uh, how do we explain the fact that uh, if metallurgy here um, influenced the, de the development of metallurgy in the Great Lakes region of East Africa, how do we explain the fact that it's the same, it's the same time bracket? So this is one of the uh, major uh, challenges. And they also argue that there are massive uh, technological differences, as we will see, between um, Egyptian furnaces, uh, Phoenician furnaces, and some uh, Moroccan furnaces when compared to the ones that are used uh, in these uh, different regions. So they are saying that perhaps this is evidence of um, local uh, development. So initially, the um, local origins hypothesis started as a, an ideological response to um, frameworks that denied Africa any, any agency, any initiative. And they say that, well, Africa had uh, multiple areas of um, invention. And um, as we can see, these are some of the areas that are believed uh, to uh, be uh, the source of um, African metallurgy. So according to this framework, then, um, Africa does, Sub-Saharan Africa does not need uh, to replicate the picture that we are seeing in these different regions because um, human beings can develop uh, in different uh, trajectories. There's no need to uh, follow the, uh, same, uh, the same pattern. So part of the uh, reasons is that obviously um, there are some activities that are happening here and there. It's just that this map um, reflects uh, the general lack of archaeological evidence, but nevertheless, um, there are different types of furnaces, uh, as we will see tomorrow, that were used uh, to smelt iron. There are some uh, what are known as tall uh, natural draft furnaces that were at least uh, the maximum height could be uh, four meters. And those were, those drew in air uh, through inlets uh, at the bottom using the principle of, uh, of convection. So, um, and then there were these uh, low shaft uh, furnaces and ball furnaces uh, the air was um, introduced uh, through, through bellows. So these are forced draft furnaces. And this is uh, the diversity that we see on the African um, continent. So what are the uh, proponents of the local origins I, hypothesis argue is that uh, perhaps this diversity, um, which is not necessarily uh, chronological, perhaps it attests to a local um, experimentation. So these are some of the um, uh, fantasies. This is just, uh, this is the Cameroon, just to give you an idea of uh, the diversity. So that's the cross section of, uh, of the furnace. This uh, furnace could uh, produce uh, cast iron and um, some uh, very high quality, high carbon uh, steel. So that's, 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 that's um, one of the um, interesting examples of uh, the local production of cast iron in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And then these are some of the, the natural draft furnaces, this time in uh, Malawi. So these vents, those are the ones that sucked in air using the uh, principle of uh, convection.